zone. He's wide open because of that little shift. Great formation for Michigan. Good execution and an easy score. Uh, I told you. That's what you said. What do you expect? Fireworks. Well, bang, bang. Here we go. Bang, bang. Here we go, folks. We've got a big weekend of college football ahead of us. Um, thank you for tuning in. I'm Joel Klatt. This is the Joel Klatt Show. And uh, we got a lot to get into. Hey, if you haven't listened this week, go back uh, Monday's podcast. I re- recap the entire weekend, including all those great uh, matchups in the top 10. On Wednesday's podcast, I talked a lot about the talent disparity in college football, and I gave you some concrete numbers of why the top teams are blowing people out and why anybody in the middle can get beat by anybody. So check that out. But today, we've got a breakdown of this week's games, and there's a lot of really good ones. I've got, let's see, what is this? Uh, Seven. Seven games that I want to talk about and give you a little bit of an overarching theme. So uh, Washington, UCLA, Michigan, Iowa, Kentucky, Ole Miss, Alabama, Arkansas, Oklahoma State, Baylor, Iowa State, Kansas and North Carolina State Clemson all of that is coming up all right so let's get started right away let's get into it first matchup of the day number four Michigan at Iowa this is going to be I I think well first of all it's our game okay so Gus Jenny and I are going to be there big noon kickoff is going to be there uh 10 a.m eastern everything gets uh started with big noon kickoff this is going to be a low-scoring affair. This is this is a game that screams defense to me, and not just because Iowa is playing in it. Um, this is going to be a really tough test, and the toughest test that we're going to see J.J. McCarthy face in his young career as the starting quarterback for Michigan, and the two play callers, Matt Weiss and Sharon Moore from Michigan. The, they will have to have learned their lessons from a week ago against Maryland, how to stay patient, how to stay conservative, how to take what the defense gives because of what Iowa does on the defensive side. I love this Iowa defense, folks. And and there's there's nothing in me that thinks that Michigan can go out there and just roll this Hawkeyes team, in particular, in, in particular at Kinnick Stadium. This is where, as Jim Harbaugh says, top five teams go to die. I think it's a low-scoring affair, and what it comes down to is turnovers. And this is what I'm concerned about for Michigan, is that their quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, is still a guy that's going to rely on his talent. He's got a lot of self-belief. He showed it a couple of times last week against Maryland when he couldn't find anybody down the field. He held the ball too long. There were two times specifically. One, he forced the ball late to a corner route in the end zone, should have been picked off. And the other time, he was in the red zone, held the ball, didn't check it down, and then all of a sudden it wound up basically being a fumble. Michigan still recovered, but he lost so many yards that they missed the ensuing field goal attempt. You can't make those errors against Iowa. Iowa does such a great job of capitalizing on your mistakes. So the young quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, is going to have to be on point. Folks, if he's late with the ball, If he doesn't throw it on time, if he's not decisive, what generally happens, you throw it behind receivers, you throw it over their head. Tips and overthrows. And Iowa has like a graduate degree in creating turnovers on tips and overthrows. I think Michigan probably wins this game, but I think it's going to be really good game, one possession late in a low-scoring affair. All right, next up. Number 10, NC State at number five, Clemson. Oh, what a good matchup this is. I really like this matchup. And when you look at the ACC right now, and in particular that side of the ACC, you know, Clemson, a win goes a long way in basically securing a division title. And you might be thinking to yourself like, geez, Joel, it's like just October, relax. Well, when you really look at it, there's two main challengers, maybe a third in that side of the ACC. Wake Forest. North Carolina State, and Florida State. Clemson already beat Wake Forest last weekend in a really great game, by the way, that overtime game, and DJ Ungalele was terrific. So they they took care of one of their challengers in the division, and now here's, here's the next challenger, NC State, which means that if they were to win this game and, let's say, Wake Forest, who plays Florida State this weekend, beats Florida State, then everybody else in that division has a loss. All all due respect to everybody else in that conference, those are your main contenders. That would mean that Clemson would have to lose twice in order for one of those teams to come back and win the division. 
So like I said, this weekend could basically lock up a division championship for Clemson. Now, on the field, why is this game interesting? Well, NC State beat Clemson a year ago. This was a team that had a program-defining win. That game was at North Carolina State. It was a game in which DJ Uy Ungalele was still struggling mightily. He only threw for 111 yards that night and was 12 of 26. This NC State team is going to find a very different Clemson team that they face this year as opposed to last year. Number one, DJ Ungalele is a vastly different player, and I think it showed last week. In a game that he had to be great, he was great. He threw for over 300 yards for the first time since that Notre Dame game in the COVID year when he stepped in for Trevor Lawrence. He's got three straight games with multiple touchdown passes, and he seems to be a guy that has taken the next step in his career as a college quarterback and will continue to play really well. There's one other element of this game that I think is a real feather in, in Clemson's cap, which is they don't get a chance to have a great home environment often because they've been so good over the years. You get the sense that that fan base is going to be cranked up and ready to go and that Death Valley is going to be rocking. Rocking, in particular after, after last year's loss to North Carolina State. This is a team in Clemson that has won 36 straight home games. I don't think that that streak is broken this weekend. Not with DJ playing better, not with that crowd being into a, a whipped up into a frenzy. I think Clemson wins, and I think I think it could be big. Even though this is what looks to be a, a top 10 matchup, I think Clemson wins, and I think they win it big, maybe by three scores. All right, next game. Number two, Alabama at number 20, Arkansas. You know, this one's interesting, folks. And the interesting part about this one, yes, listen, should Alabama win the game? Yeah, of course they should win the game. And if you listen to Wednesday's pod, you know exactly why. Okay, the talent disparity between them and the rest of college football is vast. And so should they beat Arkansas? Yes. But why is this interesting? Well, Alabama has been struggling in true road games in the last couple of years. You just go back to the start of last season, and what happened the first time they went on the road? They had to win a, a, a struggle bus type of game against Florida in the swamp by two points. Then they went to AM, got beat by Texas AM. They went to Auburn later in the year and played a four overtime game against their rival. And then this year they went on the road for the first time in 2022. And what happened? They escaped Austin by a point. So, again, those are four of their last five road tests, and they haven't played great. So you might assume that they're not going to play really well against Arkansas. And Arkansas is a team that played them tough a year ago. So you're, you could talk yourself into, hey, Arkansas has got a chance in this game. Hey, you know, Arkansas might cover all these different things. Hold on. Hold on to that thought. The reason Arkansas played so well against Alabama a year ago is that they were able to be two-dimensional on offense. Bama's defense is incredible. All right, and, and that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Last year, K.J. Jefferson threw for over 350 yards against Alabama. Why? He had a great wide receiver. We saw him drafted early in the NFL draft, Traylon Burks. Burks went eight catches for 179. It's a big reason why they were able to have success against the Tide is because they were two-dimensional. They were balanced. I don't think that they have the ability to be that balanced this year. They certainly don't have a Traylon Burke style wide receiver on the outside. And if you la watched last week's game, they weren't able to move the ball like they should have against what is, I think, a very average A&M defense. So what suggests that they're going to come out there and all of a sudden play great on offense against Bama? I think Bama wins this. I think that they win it big. And I think that Bryce Young develops more chemistry with his outside receivers. That seems to be getting better ever since that Texas game, and I think that it's going to continue in that direction. I like Alabama. I like them big, even on the road against Arkansas. Next up. Number seven, Kentucky at number 14, Ole Miss. So this one to me is like for division supremacy in the SEC. There's been a lot of talk and speculation over the last few days, and really the last week or so. It's like, hey, the SEC East, boy, the SEC East is really good, and they might be, but this game is going to go a long way in determining which side of that conference is actually better. Right now, the rankings, the AP poll, would suggest that Kentucky and Tennessee make the East the better side of the SEC. Ole Miss might say, hold my beer. 
we don't really know about Kentucky. I think Kentucky is one of those teams that if they weren't ranked so high based off of last year's performance, then they wouldn't have been shuffled up into the top 10 as quickly as they are now. I think this is a preseason bias style of rating. I don't think that they're better than Ole Miss. I think Ole Miss, by the way, is sneaky good. Ole Miss is a team that can bludgeon you on the ground. Did you know that Ole Miss is fourth in the country in rushing? I bet you didn't. Did you know that they've got a two-headed running back monster right now and they can include their quarterback in that rushing game that is killing folks? Zach Evans, the transfer from TCU, highly recruited player to TCU, he's at Ole Miss, and Quinshawn Judkins, or Judkins, one of the two. We'll, we'll figure that out. But Quinshawn is a heck of a player, running it for over 100 yards per game. You've got Zach Evans there. He's a talented guy. And I think offensively, Ole Miss is a style of team that can just – grind you into submission because of the way that they can run the football I don't know what Kentucky is this is for division supremacy and with the game being at Ole Miss you start to look at the trend of what Ole Miss is at home Lane Kiffin in his first three home games at Ole Miss 0-3 you'd be like man bad start for Lane Kiffin since that point 12 and 0 at home. They're 12 and 0 in their last 12 at home. Give me Ole Miss in this one. I think they take care of business. They beat Kentucky, and we start to look at the SEC West as the better side of the SEC than the East. Next up, number 15, Washington at UCLA. Oh, this is a sneaky good game. Friday night, if you don't know about it. Um, Washington is one of those teams, and I think that we should put them in the same category as like. Minnesota, you know, sneaky, really good, better, definitely better than Kansas, but equally good story. Like, we didn't expect a lot. You've got Kalen DeBoer comes in here as a head coach. You've got to transfer a quarterback. What are they? They've played really well, folks. They've played really well. If you haven't looked, Michael Penix, their quarterback, now reunited with his old coach from Indiana. Kalen DeBoer was the OC at Indiana when he was kind of splitting time there. Now they get back together, and what is he doing? Leading the nation in passing. Michael Penix, your nation's leading passer. Which, by the way, why doesn't he get more conversation as like a Heisman guy into October? Because he should. It can't always just be about who's the best player for Alabama and Georgia and Ohio State. Those players are clearly going to be there, and I've read articles that like Brock Bowers should be the Heisman Trophy winner. That's all well and good. Let's start looking around, though. Let's start widening our gaze for the great stories in college football because one of them is happening up there in Seattle with Michael Penix. Penix is a heck of a player. He's thrown for 347 yards per game. This matchup against UCLA is so fascinating to me because at the top of the Pac-12, I feel like we're going to have chaos. I've been telling people for any number of weeks, hey, man, this is really good. Those top four teams in the Pac-12, watch out for Oregon, watch out for Washington, watch out for Utah, and watch out for USC. And all the while, I left UCLA out of that conversation. This game to me is all about, is this a four-team league or is this a five-team league? All right, is this like super chaos or is it just relative chaos? In a league in which did away with divisions and they're going to put the two teams with the best record in their championship game in Vegas at the end of the year. I think it's a fascinating ordeal. Now, one of the things that UCLA is going to have to combat is the fact that I don't expect a great environment at the Rose Bowl. We've all seen those pictures. There's nobody at the Rose Bowl. Now, granted, they're on the quarter system. They don't have their students on campus until now. And should it be better? Yes. Is it Washington? Yes. It's a Friday night. Have you, dri have you ever driven around L.A. on a Friday evening? It's brutal. Brutal. I bet it's 35% full at kick time as they're going to kick that one off at 730 local here on the West Coast, which, by the way, that's a 1030 East Coast game. Pac-12, you just can't get out of your own way. I love this matchup. I do think UCLA is balanced. They can run it. They can throw it. They've got their veteran quarterback. I like what Chip Kelly is doing. But this Washington team, there's something special about it. People don't talk about Washington a lot, but this is – at least in my estimation, one of the major brands in college football. And the reason is, up in Seattle, you'd be shocked at the following that the Huskies have up in Seattle. It's a great fan base. It's a great place to play. And I think that they're brewing something really good up there in Seattle. So give me Washington in that one. Next up. Number nine, Oklahoma State at number 16, Baylor. 
Oh, okay. Rematch of the Big 12 title game from a year ago. And boy, when you look at a conference that is as deep as any in college football, I think that that's fair. There's not a tough game, or excuse me, there's not an easy game, I should say. Every game is a tough game in that conference. And so when you get two teams that have title aspirations, boy, these games become monumental. I mean, monumental. The winner of this game puts themselves in what I like to call the catbird seat in the Big 12. If you look at their two matchups a year ago, they split. Baylor's the defending Big 12 champ. You might think to yourself, Baylor at home, they're the defending Big 12 champ. I like Baylor on this one. Hold on. Hold on. Because if you actually go back and you watch those two matchups last year, which I did this week, and when you look into them and you really dive into what happened, Oklahoma State outplayed Baylor pretty dramatically in both of those games. Numbers back that up. If you combine those eight quarters of football that these two played against each other a year ago, you'd see that Oklahoma State outgained them by 212 total yards and by 23 first downs. They were dominant. So why did they split? Why were they close games? Turnovers. Spencer Sanders threw seven interceptions in the in that ball game in those two ball games. Seven. Like you can't do that and win the game. And it ultimately came back and bit them in that game in the Big 12 championship. If they would have won that, by the way, it would have been a huge debate about who was actually going to be in the playoff with that fourth spot. It went to Georgia. Georgia, well, Georgia was third, Cincinnati was fourth, but Georgia went on to to win the national championship. I say that only to say if they can hold on to the football, they should beat Baylor, even on the road. I think that they're better. They've got a veteran quarterback. I trust them a little bit more. Have they played anybody? No. Did they lose their defensive coordinator? Yes. But Oklahoma State, if they don't turn the ball over, is a better team than Baylor. That's where the game is won and lost. Again, last year, severely outplayed them, ended up splitting, won at home, lost in the Big 12 championship game. Why? Their quarterback, Spencer Sanders, seven interceptions, no touchdowns. That has to turn around. If they don't turn the ball over, then I like Oklahoma State in that one. All right, next up. Iowa State at Kansas. You know why this one's in the pod today? Because I am not doing a podcast and not mentioning Kansas until they're ranked. You cowards. All right, I talked about this on Wednesday's episode. Kansas should be ranked. They should absolutely be ranked. And I'm going to continue to talk about them to keep them in your ears, AP voters, until you do it, until you actually look at the games and evaluate the teams for what they've done this year and not what you thought they were in the preseason. I'll bring up the comparison again. Pitt was ranked in the preseason – They've gone out there. They've lost a game. They beat West Virginia at home. They've got, what, the 40, I think it's 43rd ranked offense in the country. They've only scored 16 touchdowns and, or 18 touchdowns, excuse me. They've got a strength of record of somewhere in the 40s, 17th in the preseason, and they're ranked and Kansas is not. Kansas has a strength of record of six. They've got the fourth-ranked scoring offense in America. They've got Jalen Daniels, who, like Michael Penix, should be talked about going into October as one of those players playing himself into the Heisman Trophy contention. They've scored 27 touchdowns as a team. The only other team in college football that has scored that many touchdowns is Ohio State, who I have said many times has the best offense in all of college football. Kansas is for real. They host Iowa State this week. I hope that the environment is as good as it was last week for Duke. I think Kansas wins the game. I think Kansas wins the game, and maybe you cowards and the AP will actually vote this team in and put them in to the AP poll. They deserve it. Lance Leipold deserves it. Jalen Daniels deserves it. Their fan base deserve it. Do the right thing. Going to be a tough game because Iowa State is not an easy foe, but Jalen Daniels is going to be the best player on the field, and I think that he and the Jayhawks beat the Cyclones. All right, folks. That's going to do it for today's edition of the Joel Klatt Show. Appreciate you listening. Go and download this show. Subscribe to the podcast so that you get all the episodes. We come out every Monday, every Wednesday, and every Thursday, every single week. 
I, I can't thank you enough for listening and being a part of this show as we start up this brand new Joel Class Show. You can follow us on social media at Joel Class Show. You can follow me at Joel Clatt on, tw on Twitter, at Joel underscore Clatt on Instagram. And it's going to be a wild weekend, folks. I'm going to be in Iowa City, Kinnick Stadium. We're heading your way. Can't wait to see you. Enjoy the weekend, everybody.